Welcome back once again to Go Fund This. I'm your host, Rob Southgate. Hey, I can't believe the excellent response I'm getting to this show. So many creators have reached out hoping to get on the show. And so many of you, the listeners, have written in to let me know you love hearing about these projects. And some are finding inspiration to start their own. It's really exciting. As I said last episode, I'm going to share a tip each episode to help you have a more successful crowdfunding project. Let's get right into it. Today's tip, engage with your community. Engagement is key when trying to build interest in a project. Find where people that are your target are congregating online and be an active participant. Facebook groups are a great place to start. I got this tip from an interview I did with John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneur on Fire when he guested on my podcast, New Media Lab. I had asked him how he would make people aware of his podcast today if he were just starting out. His answer absolutely applies to anyone with a Kickstarter or a Patreon or an Indiegogo or really anything they're trying to get attention for. What he said is he would find a couple of Facebook groups that are focused on his subject and would get engaged, there's that word again, with the community before letting them know about his project. He suggested finding a way to engage every day for 30 days. John said, Start by replying to a post, at least one once a day. Answer a question, share a resource, give a tip. Make sure it's a reply, not just a thumbs up, so other members of the group start seeing your name. After a week or so, you post a question to the group and make sure to reply to each response. Don't promote your project or talk about yourself too much. People love to talk about themselves and to show how smart they are. If they sense you're only there to promote, many are going to figure that out. So play the long game and engage earnestly without promotion. Keep in mind, you you want to do this for 30 days. Mark it on your calendar if you have to. Keep in mind, you obviously have a shared interest with this community, so lean into that and have fun with it. Eventually, you will build trust and your reveal is going to feel really organic. Just remember these three words, engage, engage, engage. Update. Foot Fist Frankenstein has eight days to go with its Kickstarter, and it's already more than doubled its original goal. This is an amazing success, and there's still time for you to back it. Tom's project has passed its first stretch goal with three more to go, so let's keep this going and see if we can help unlock all of them. Okay. Let's get into this episode. Today, I have Chris Morin and Nick Macari to discuss their Kickstarter for their new comic book, Peerless. Here's the logline from the Kickstarter. A Wing Chun master fights her way through New York City's toughest gangs to stop the execution of her lover at the hands of an occult martial arts clan hell-bent on stealing her secret ancient martial art technique. Set against the historic NYC blackout of 1977, a kick-ass kung fu master and a bunch of wannabe kung fu teens take on every badass gang in the South Bronx, Chinese triads, an evil kung fu master of the dark supernatural arts, and his three boss-level baddies. I'll have all the links to Chris's and Nick's social media and the Kickstarter in the show notes, so please check it out and support this project in whatever ways you can. Let's get into it. Here are Chris and Nick. Nick, Chris, welcome to Go Fund This. I'm so happy to have you guys here. Uh, let's talk about your project. So your Kickstarter is Peerless, a Kung Fu comic. Uh, what can you tell us? Why don't we Why don't we start there? Since you do have this Kickstarter going, uh, what is Peerless? Chris, well, first go ahead. Of all, yeah, thanks for having us on, Rob. Um, our Our project is titled peerless it's a comic book slash um, music project and it um came about back in 2017 i was uh writing original music for well what i was gonna i was gonna do a, a an album of original music i've been playing in in bands and a professional musician for 25 years here in cleveland and so um but i hadn't done a lot of or had time to do a lot of original music on my own. And so in 2017, I 
I have a studio here. I got all my instruments out and I just started playing. And um, over time, a theme seemed to emerge and it was kind of sounding like the soundtrack to a 1970s kung fu movie that had never been made and uh i decided you know i want to tell a story here develop a narrative so i kind of outlined what the story was going to be and you know one thing led to another and i ended up with a script and i was like i think this could be a comic book uh, but i'd never written a comic book before i love comics i've got tons of them here and am a regular reader and have been for most of my life. Um, so I reached out to Nick, and he is a fantastic editor. And I said, "Hey, man, tear this apart. Tell me why I'm a terrible writer, and uh, you know, help me get better." And he not only delivered that, but then uh, maybe this is a good point to kind of hand off the baton to Nick to tell him tell you what uh, his experience was on his end. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, unless Rob wants to jump in and ask go any ahead. questions or anything. Okay, go cool. ahead. Go ahead. Um, so w- when I got Chris's original script, um, you know, my first thought was, okay, so it's, it's a, a Kung Fu kind of action thriller thing. And, you know, I, that was refreshing to me because, you know, as an editor, a, a lot of stuff in the indie comic scene is usually superheroes or, you know, um, it usually stays narrow focus and, and this was kind of new and refreshing and I was like, okay, that's cool. And then I realized as I'm reading the script, like it takes place in New York and it, and it doesn't just take place in New York, but it's like central to New York. Like this, this story wouldn't have worked in Chicago or LA or, you know, anywhere else it had to take place in New York. And then all these crazy gangs start coming out. And immediately I was like, oh man, this is like the warriors. And, you know, it's, it takes place in, in the 70s. I'm like, this is totally this is like this is like an unofficial sequel to the Warriors. And then this is what I'm thinking as I'm reading the script. And um, he's not giving himself enough credit because the, the script that he put together was was really good. And, you know, had a lot of uh, great elements to it. And immediately I was like, wow, I was like really super impressed with it. And when I gave it back to him, I was like, I basically he's he's being a little humble. I gave it script back to him with some edits. And I said, you have to let me work on this with you wow. like it's not it's not like you know maybe we can do something it's like no no you don't get to leave until you agree <laughs> that yes we can do this together wow that's saying a lot that's really yeah. saying a lot because knowing your your history nick and knowing like your what you bring to the table as a writer that's impressive on your part chris well and i was just completely taken aback i i you know this came out of a place of I'm a fan of all these things. I love the Warriors. I love Shaw Brothers Kung Fu movies. Uh, I love New York City in the 70s, right? The the birth of hip hop and the, the amazing, you know, funk music that was happening at the time. And I just wanted to throw it into a story. I thought it would be fun. I thought it all blended really well together. And then to get that validation from a seasoned writer like Nick was like, oh, all right, so maybe I do have something here and this is certainly worth pursuing. And when a, a writer like Nick says, I need to be a part of this project, uh, who am I to be like, uh, no, I think I'm going to do it by myself. No, I was, I was super excited to have him on board. So uh, it's been, and it's been awesome. Yeah. Well, and everybody needs an editor, you know what I oh, mean? Yeah. <laughs> so the fact that you reached out to him and he came back with some notes and it wasn't like, we're burning this to the ground, but you've got a kernel of an idea <laughs> Yeah, right. is, is pretty amazing. Uh, and everything you're saying, anyone that's listened to my other shows, I mean, I've, I've been on thousands of podcasts and I, I definitely have, uh, exposed what I like on those knows that stuff like the Warriors, Kung Fu movies, the, the music part of it, this is all so deep in my wheelhouse. I'm just super excited about this project. Now we got to address something right up front here. Chris, Mm -hmm. you're a trombone player, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. That's uh that's that's my trade. I've been doing that uh for gosh, 30 32 years now. Yeah, that's the most shocking part to me because it's not usually the trombone player that you think of as, you know, the driving force in a band. So, <laughs> I'm really imp- I'm a saxophone player. My dad was an avant-garde sure. jazz drummer, so Oh, nice. Yeah, man, but we we do have to uh we do have to uh mock the trombone player a little bit. Although I was well, it, it happens, it happens. <laughs> I'm sure. You're you're the bass player of the orchestra. Uh, I was, uh, it's a bad joke. I was looking at your website though. Uh, I'm going to encourage people on a couple of 
points right here before we go on. Uh, first of all, check out Nick's website. Uh, if you listen to Alley Chats, I just did an episode with Nick and we talked all about his writing and, and what he does. Uh, Nick McCary, uh, I hope I said that right. Uh, yeah. NickMcCary.com. I'll put it in the show notes. Go to his website. You'll be blown away by the stuff he's done. But then last time I was talking to him, he said, Hey, you got to check out Chris's website and skinny music, right? Skinny K skinny, music. Skinny K music. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Man, this is so cool. And I love the idea that all of this stemmed from you just creating some music and, and it took you somewhere. That is real artistic expression. I think this is just such a, a, a cool project and it stems from such a cool place. Rob, I really appreciate that, man. And and it's and it's true. I mean, OK, so first of all, <laughs> being a trombone player, uh, we don't work a lot. You know, there's the joke. Uh, what did the trombone player say in his last gig? Uh, you want prize with that? Um, uh, so I as a aspiring professional musician, I had to look at, OK, well, what am I going to do to make a career in music work and that was that meant like looking at all angles of the music industry so in addition oh, good, to good, good god for a second i thought you said comics i thought that was gonna be your fallback <laughs> position i was like oh no <laughs> because there's another joke all. with that Not at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah right um so i i thought uh, i thought to myself well you know if uh you know, there's only so many gigs that a trombone player can get. So let's work on my writing and let's work on my arranging skills and let's uh, work on, you know, producing events. So I've, you know, back in two th- 2013, I did a uh, Nightmare Before Christmas 20th anniversary concert uh, in which I arranged all the music, assembled the 20 piece orchestra um contacted the club like i i did everything by myself to make that event happen wow and and so you know um this this constant exploration this constant wanting to produce um great art and and also a desire to tell compelling stories i mean when i write music and i'm writing lyrics i'm doing my best to evoke a reaction from the listener or to take a listener to a a new and interesting place. And when it came to creating this story, it it just, it's a natural transition because it, it it comes from the same place. You want to tell a a compelling story. You want people to be engaged in it. And so the only thing I had to, you know, well, not the only thing, but one of the major things I had to really focus on was like, all right, well, I'm not, doing this through music at least not completely i'm gonna write this script and so what do writers have to do to grab onto an audience to get an audience to engage in that story and and so i did a lot of research in that and and read tons of stories and analyzed them and then you know once nick was on board like i just he gave me tons of homework to do which was super helpful and um it's been an incredibly fulfilling creative project. I mean, I've made music for such a long time and to explore this other creative avenue uh, with a, an equally passionate writer and artist has just been uh, an amazing experience. Yeah. Very exciting. And, and Nick, you, you come at this uh, having uh, written a number of different comics and, and books uh this one lit you up. Have you ever explored this era, this type of thing? I know that you, you know, I've looked at some of the things you've done, but have you ever done like a seventies Kung Fu book before? Um, I don't think so. Not I've been writing for over two decades. Um, it was like the late nineties where I first got into comics. Um, I, I think, you know, I've, I would be hard pressed to think that I've never had like 70 characters appear somewhere or do something like that. But as far as a, a focal point, uh, especially, you know, 70s New York City, I don't think I've ever this is probably the first first one that I've worked on like that, which I'm sure had a lot of, um, you know, is one of the things I was attracted to because I'm a child of the 70s, 80s in New York City. And, you know, that it's it's sort of like kismet sometimes as certain projects, like the fact that he just happened to throw this on my desk. Right. Literally, this whole story takes place in the South Bronx and I'm from the Bronx. 
And Kristen don't know that because I don't say that anywhere on any of my social media that I'm from the Bronx. Some places I probably say I'm from New York City. But yeah, I'm from the Bronx. And this story is in the Bronx. And, you know, so many things lined up. So I was like, yeah. Yeah. Very, how do you, how do you not do this? Right. Yeah. How, how do you not do it? Right. So the Kickstarter, uh, I'm going to go through here. It says the Kickstarter is for a 24 page 32. If you hit the stretch goal, which hopefully you do a uh, full color standard American floppy comic, it's issue one of eight. So this will be the thing that launches you into this eight issue series. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's great. Um, the, uh, we've got, it says uh, here, a true love letter to four very distinct things. Listen to this. I mean, you guys already know, but to me, the, this already has me sold. Number one, Kung Fu. Number two, Walter Hill's 79 classic, The Warriors. Number three, New York City. Number four, attitude from strong female lead movies like Coffee and Foxy Brown. That's a layup. Those are all things that I want to see mashed up. I want to see happen in a comic. Take the strong writing, trick, take the strong art. Uh, Nick and I talked on the other show about the artwork in here. Now you, you found a couple of artists. Are they from Argentina? Is that correct? Yeah. Um, Spain, different parts of Spain, Valencia. Um, I, I think it gets a little confusing because where they're born and then, you know, like everybody else, they move yeah, around. Right, so, right. so, so we just say Spain, cover all the bases. Um, but yeah, Pablo, uh, Pepino, uh, he's the interior artist and he is just, you know, if, if you see his work and, you know, he's, he was doing skies of fire for, I think they had an eight issue run and I don't know if they're doing more arcs with that, but his amount of detail is just insane what he puts in his panels. And, um, I think he was very attracted to, it's, it's like what you touched on right there when you said the four distinct things. And, and that's what I picked up when I first saw Chris's script. It's, it is so fresh and, and unique. And it's not, it's not like these things never existed before, but just bringing them together like this. And, you know, if it has been done in some sense, we haven't seen it in a very, very long time. And I'm talking about in any medium. Um, and then I think Pablo picked up on that too when I presented it to him. And, uh, he, he thought this very gritty urban New York City 1970s would match his style of like super detail really well. Um, you know, I don't, if you saw the, the building shot that we have there on the campaign and, you know, there's a, a scene in the first book that takes place in the South Street seaport. So you have, you know, that crazy hectic with all the guys moving the fish and the ice and all that stuff. And it just, the detail is just off the hook. It really is. And it's, it's, uh, it's really stylized at the same time. So, you know, that's something that I find sometimes with indie books when they're trying, when they're having lofty goals and you, you and I talked about the indie scene and how much we love it yesterday or on the other show. Uh, sometimes it, they, they do the detail, but it looks unfinished or it looks too clean. Sometimes this looks, it has the right amount of grit. This looks like it could, could have come out from, you know, vertigo or, mm. you know, dark horse could pick this up in a heartbeat and it, it stands tall with the best books. I love the artwork in this. And I think it's really, like I said, stylized, strong, uh, he did a beautiful job. And then there's also, uh, you've got Pablo doing the art and then, uh, Damien doing colors on it. And the colors are, are spot on as well. It reminds me of a movie like the warriors. Like it's got that feel like, like if you're a Tarantino fan, you're going to dig this. It totally. had to Rob. I mean, it really did. I mean, if you're going to write a story that takes place in the Bronx in 1977, you know, that whole area or large pieces of that area were just destroyed. I mean they look like war zones when yeah, you look they at do. pictures from the Bronx. Literally, and, yeah. and so you you can't you couldn't do a polished art, you know, for this book because it wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't it would it wouldn't it seem wouldn't authentic. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and it so, really captures that feeling like the garbage everywhere and everything. Like I I, I could feel it when I look at these these pages. Mm. Awesome. So okay, let's talk about the tiers you guys have that people can come in on because this is this is important we got to get people backing this project uh like i said it's the beginning of something great so you might as well get on the ground floor uh right now at the moment we're recording this we're at 106 backers at 3400 just under 3500 uh the the goal first tier 
is five grand. So I feel confident you, you're going to hit it. You got 20 days to go. But let's talk about these tiers and let's see if we can't push it over so we can start getting to that bigger book, that stretch goal. <laughs> That's awesome, Rob. Thank you. Um, Nick, why don't you talk about the the extended version of the first issue? Because it's really worth it, guys. Like 5,000 will get the first book out and you'll enjoy that. But if we get to that 8,000 level, this additional scene, I almost hate calling it an additional scene because it's that good. It's it's so much fun. So, so yeah, the the first stretch goal that we have is eight grand and that's really at a minimum where we're hoping that this comes in because like he like chris just said we're pegging it as an additional scene but really it's kind of integral to to what this first issue is and and the issue will stand alone if we have to that it's not there um but basically what what the the extra eight pages are is it's a a more in-depth introduction into who the main villains of the series are and um you know i don't don't want to really give away what happens but we we see these main villains um it's the main uh the main kung fu master villain and then he has like three boss i call them boss level henchmen that's how we refer to them And, and they come in of course into play later on throughout the series but then there's these two large villainous organizations and uh, there's this whole little uh, whole little conflict in this end scene between these guys. And it's pretty engaging and it's it's action packed. And uh, we really hope we can get it in there. Yeah, it, it looks important. I mean, it's eight pages uh, when you consider the size of the book. It, that's that's an entire storyline coming in there. Uh, and it's a confrontation with the triads. I think that is something I want to see. So 8,000 is the goal we really want to hit on this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and then you have a couple other stretch goals. You want to talk music, Chris? Yeah, sure. So uh, the original vision of this project I had was, you know, you would get an issue with two original music tracks that would accompany it so that while you're reading, I I don't know about, Nick, I, I thought, although I think I do, when I'm reading, writing, I'm listening to music all the time. And often the music I'm listening to informs what I'm writing or helps me, helps to kind of inspire the writing. Um, but also, I, I just like the idea of having music that helps create the mood for the book that you're reading. I mean, Pablo's art is already doing an amazing job. Damien's colors super important in creating that mood. Well, we just want to add another element to that, which is the music element. Let, let so, me jump in. Let me yeah. jump in for one second. As as a writer, when I'm when I'm writing, and I've said I posted about this numerous times, you know, most writers will cue up um, instrumental soundtracks when they write. You don't usually want dialogue music because that usually interferes with your thinking and your writing. And one of the best experiences as a writer, when you have like the Lord of the Rings soundtrack or whatever it is playing, is that it totally cues up to the scene that you're writing. So like as you're getting more to the climatic part, the music starts building up. Now you can't control that. But when that happens and it does happen occasionally, it's it's a it's a real moment. So I think that's kind of what you're you're touching on for the readers, you know, to have something to go along that. You know, if this were a movie, these this would be the soundtrack that was playing during each of these scenes. Exactly. And, um, you know, the the influence of Coffee and Foxy Brown, uh, if you watch a lot of those movies from the 70s, you know, Shaft and um, there there's great theme songs to those to those movies. And so I wrote a theme song for the series. Um, called High Above the Pain, and I hired musicians, and I I have a producer who's you know on board and and ready to make this sound like a record you found in the back bin of a record shop. You're gonna pull it out, and it's gonna have the that kind of vintage sound to it, that analog sound to it. Um, so we we I hired all these musicians, wrote the music, booked the recording session. We were set to go in March, and then. COVID happened and the studio had to close down and everybody obviously, you know, wasn't going out in public. Yeah. And, um, so where we sit right now is, um, we have figured out how to do the recording by, um, like having small groups of people come in at a time. 
But in order to make sure everybody's safe and, and there's no issues with the recording session, um, we had to rent out a larger studio space and we had to uh, hire additional engineer. And with the already large budget and amount of money we've invested in the book, um, there just wasn't money to do the music um, aspect of that. So we created this tier, um, this stretch goal, that if we raise those funds, then we can pull the trigger on getting in the studio and recording. The, the music's already written. The musicians are already booked. The producer's on board. We've already talked about what it's going to sound like. We're just waiting for the funds to allow us to get in the studio and actually make it happen. You know, it, it's almost like an entirely separate project, even though it's tied to it. And it's <laughs> it's one of those that I'm looking at it going, this has to happen too. It's it's reminding me of a couple of things. Uh, one is you were talking about writers and their soundtracks. Um, I have a friend uh, who's a comic book writer. He wrote Mice Templar and Furious uh, Brian Glass. I don't know if you know him. Sure. But he posts pictures of the soundtracks he's listening to every day that are inspiring him. And there are all these, you know, these instrumental soundtracks. And every day I look at them and I'm like, oh, man, I got to go get my playlist out because it's it's so great. It just makes your mind explode without having the words get in the way. Uh, Mike Nesmith put out an album, uh, you know, the monkeys, the guy from the monkeys. Mm -hmm. uh, but he did a lot of solo stuff and he had an album, a concept album that was the reverse. It was called The Prison. And it was a soundtrack basically that you were supposed to read. What, he had a book that came with it. And you were supposed to read the book while the soundtrack played. Yeah. And I always thought that was such a cool concept. So the idea of buying or of getting music to read along with a comic like this and having this soundtrack that's, you know, got that air of 70s New York just sounds absolutely amazing. To me. Cool. Yeah, I'm doing my, my best Willie Hutch impression when uh, <laughs> we get to this theme song. And uh, you can hear some of the, the demos. So um what i did is uh I, I wrote the music and then in my studio kind of put together um samples of the music but i'm playing all the parts so it's you know it's it's fine i think it sounds good but it's not even remotely close to what the finished product will be like when we right. have live musicians um but I, I did post those on my soundcloud page and you can access those through my website if you want to get just like a little flavor of uh, what that music's going to sound like. Oh, cool. I didn't do that yet. I'm going to have to do that. Skinnykmusic.com. That's where you can find it. Mm -hmm. There's a and, link in the website. And I want to I wanna throw in real quick on this whole music thing, because I can't really speak too much of it. I'm not a music guy. But when, when we were going through all this um, and we were figuring out the project with the fact that coronavirus came up and, you know, it really kind of threw our plans in, in a jumble, um, Chris came and was like, look, he's like, you know, we got to do the comic. He was like, basically he was like, let's forget about the music. Uh, we'll do that another time. I'll figure something else out or, you know, just whatever it'll have to be. It'll have to be. And so he, and I, and I knew, I mean, this whole project started from his music, right? That's where this came from. It was right. the music and then the comic, right? And I knew like that was a huge sacrifice for him. And just the fact that he wanted to do that, I was like, that's crazy. And I had listened to the tracks that he had, uh, you know, that he's sharing through the site and whatnot. And they're good. They're really good. They, they really do sound like what you would hear from a movie of that period, you know? Yeah. And so I basically told, I, I put my foot down again, right? I, I put my foot down a lot. Um, and I said, no, I said, this music has to be attached to the project. I said, let's, let's, you know, what do you actually need for the studio? Again, I don't know nothing about music and let's put that in as a stretch goal. So, you know, it's a little, it's a little high. It's at the 13,000 mark, I think, right, Chris? 12, five, 12, five. So, so that's where it's at. But, you know, I figured even if it was going to be an extra, like we had to get it in there, it had to represent. If, if I can also just add, you know, if you're considering supporting this project, if we get close to that, you know, that tier, that stretch goal, um, you know, that all of that money is going to the studio owner, which is a local studio owner and to the producer who is a 
Cleveland-based producer, and two Cleveland-based musicians, all of whom are not working right now. So this is not only are you helping make this music aspect of this project come to life, but like these are people who are losing gigs left and right. People who are like struggling to make ends meet right now. I would love to be able to help them. I mean, many of them are my friends and I care about them deeply. So this is a great opportunity for us to not only record high quality music and make our project even more exciting, but also to help some people out who really need it right now. Yeah. You know, I was having a thought while I was listening to this as well, knowing what that stretch goal is and how that gets there. I think people that want to support this, once again, they'd be into the music as well. They should consider, like, let's say they're saying, oh, I'm going to come in at the $10 level. Consider it a separate Kickstarter at that point. Maybe if I was going to do 10, maybe throw in 15. That's how you're going to get to that stretch goal. You know, that extra bit. View it as, oh, I, well, I gave another five for a different Kickstarter, which is the soundtrack, and yeah. make it happen because that's really how it's going to get there. But I think you yeah, guys are on the way. I mean, you've got 20 days to go, and uh, I think this this whole thing looks like it could happen. So, so, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're doing pretty good, and uh, we have a lot of faith in it. We have a lot of faith in the production, you know, across the board. We tried to assemble the best team we could, and, and we just, you know, believe in that. Um, and I think we might have talked about this the other day. What we're encountering now, at least what I'm encountering now, I was literally about 20 minutes before we got onto this uh, discussion here. I have been blocked on Facebook by sending anyone a private message. And the reason why is because no one is seeing my posts on this project on Facebook. And I have started to reach out to actual friends. Now, I have – I think the, the cap on Facebook is 5,000 friends unless you're like a famous person, which I'm not. So I have close to 5,000 friends and I've been reaching out to the ones that actually communicate with me that I know. And I have been asking them like, have you, like, you seen that I've been posting at this new Kickstarter? Keep in mind uh, – I'm not trying to say how special I am, but I haven't done a creator-owned book in 21 years. So for me, this is kind of a big deal. I've worked on plenty of projects. I've contributed. I've written stuff for other people over the years. But this is the, the first thing that I'm doing that I really have a, a, a part in it, a stake in it, that you know, co-creator. And so in any case, I've been messaging people and, and asking them if they've seen what we've been put, putting together. And everyone is saying no. People are like, what do you mean you put out a book? You put out a book? Oh, my God. Where is it? What's going on? You know? So sure, they could be uh, embarrassed and kind of lying, but I don't think that's the case because they're pretty much all saying that. And and then in the content, in the context of messaging these friends, Facebook has decided that basically that I'm spam. And I think we know the truth is they're just trying to get money for their own promotions. Right. But the whole point of that long-winded thing is that we are having trouble getting eyes on this because the social media is, is you know basically censoring us. So if nobody knows about it, you know. It's, yeah, it's, well, uh, that actually brings up another good point, which I, I think I make on every one of these shows. But even if if you're listening to this and you think it's really cool and you're like, yeah, I, I really can't support it this way right now. Another way to support is to blast it out on your social media. Tell your friends, tell your family, because I'm telling you, I've seen it happen. I saw it happen with our book when I, we put out a book last year and – there were people when when other people shared that there was a Kickstarter, all of a sudden people that had no idea that had an interest in this that were loosely connected were con- were contacting us and were were supporting. So absolutely share this as much as possible. Get the word out there because there are people that would be interested, like me. I think I found you through uh, was it I can't remember who somebody posted on Facebook. And I started yeah. looking at the project. And I was like, this is really cool. And that's how I met you, Nick. Uh, was because yeah. I saw somebody else's post that just shared this project. So I encourage people to do that. But I encourage you to throw a few bucks in here as well because every little bit is going to add up real fast. So, so I want to say two things on that point and then I'll throw it – I'll shut up and throw it back to Chris. <laughs> One – um, I actually was just talking to someone today and they were, you know, people feel embarrassed. I mean, especially now with the whole Corona thing, you know, money's tight with everybody pretty much. And I, I think people feel embarrassed that they can't pledge or they can't pledge a big thing. 
And I actually tell all my friends that I'm talking to wherever I can on social media, I'm saying, don't back. I don't want you to back. Instead, tell your friends yeah. because it is the exposure that is more important. I mean, if you want to back, that's great, but that's not what I'm asking for. What I'm asking for is to share and to spread and get the eyes because so many people that see it, will they contact and like, oh my God, you know, this is great. looks great. We love it. We, we want to help, you know, this type of thing. The other thing is so many people think, uh, that they have to back the higher pledges or, you know, the $16 pledge, 20 or 30, whatever. I am totally fine with a dollar pledge. Or if you just want to back the, the digital, which is, uh, I don't remember if the five lowest dollars. one is five bucks. Yeah. So if you want to do that, I mean, I'm totally fine with the dollar pledge because it gets you as a part of the community. It gets you maybe involved to the point where you do share it, our updates or whatever. Right. And, I would be ecstatic to, to wake up one day and have like $500 pledges. Like it's the money is secondary. It really is. Yeah. Cause I think it's, it's the audience and the support and the community that we want to build. That is the more important thing. Well, and that's I what I was it. saying. You, you put that $5 pledge, make it six and that's going to help make the music happen too, but it's mm-hmm. still a small amount. It's, it's a cup of coffee. Um, I, I think it's, uh, you know, being a, touring musician and in my younger years um a lot of what you do as a touring musician is just get in front of people and then you go out and you talk to those people and you 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 know show them how passionate you are about the music you're making and you listen to them when they have a reaction to what you've done and it's a magical experience and it's you can have that with writing a book um if you're going to conventions and stuff like that but you know this is being our our first, you know, issue of the series and, and just trying to get it started. We d- we are kind of dependent on the internet to, to be that right now. Um, but we're, I think when you, when Nick talks about making that $1 donation and then being engaged in the project, that's, that's exactly our, our hope because our hope is that once you're engaged, you're going to see how successful it is. You're going to see the development of it over time. And, you know, maybe, Later on, you will be in a position where you can make a bigger contribution or you're going to want to buy the other seven issues after the first one. Uh, and we are very adamant in everything that we've done thus far with creating this project that we want to build community. It's very important to us. We know that there are other nerds out there like us who love the Warriors, Kung Fu movies, you know, black exploitation films like we know that <laughs> there are people out there who love this material and we can't wait to interact with you. Like we can't wait for you to be a part of this journey with us. So cool. All right. So everybody go to Kickstarter, look up peerless P E E R L E S S. I will put it in the show notes. And of course, anything we tweet out or anything, will have links as well. Uh, and also check out Nick's website, Nick Macari dot com and check out chris's website skinny k music and there is just a lot to dig through and a lot of fun stuff at both of those support this project it's a really really good one and uh do you guys want to give a social media shout out before we close out uh i'm good i can't remember all my social media stuff it's (laughs) you can find it all through my website that's what i just tell people yeah and um we are we do have a page on Facebook. It's a peerless Kung Fu comic on Facebook. So please join us on that page for updates and our developing playlist. Nick and I are curating a, an excellent 1970s playlist right now. <laughs> have you seen, it, seen any of that, Rob? I have not. I'm going to do it as yeah. soon as we're off here. Oh yeah. That's it. I'm actually kind of surprised because I've been dumping music in there since, you know, we started that page like, I don't know, a month or two ago. And, you know, all sorts of really cool 70s, you know, period specific to this, um, you know, funk music and and uh, disco stuff, you know, just some crazy stuff. Basically, it's very much Tarantino ish because, you know, how he is so involved in the different uh, musical tracks that he puts to his movies. Right. And uh, taking that kind of approach. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I maybe people are secretly listening to it, but not too many people have commented on it. I'm like, come on, this is classic stuff. What's going on? <laughs> right. All right. That's it. Thank you guys so much. And good luck with this project. I know you're going to hit that stretch goal because it has to happen. Thanks, Rob. We really appreciate the time to be on your show. All right. Thanks, Rob. 
I've put the link to the Kickstarter in the show notes, and we'll also have it on posts at our social media. Once again, sharing this project with your followers and friends is key, so please be an active participant and spread the word. While you're in the mood, please share this episode. That draws attention to this show, which we can always use. Oh, and please rate and review us. It only takes a few seconds and makes a huge impact on how many people see when we post a new episode. If you have a crowdfunding project, reach out to me at southgatemediagroup at gmail.com, on Twitter at rsouthgate, or on Facebook at GoFundThisPodcast. Tell me a little about the project or what you create, and I'll consider featuring it on the show. I would love to help you make your project a reality. Thanks for listening, everyone. Until next time, go fund this.